first thought I have is um, I just got back from uh, John Bryden, who is a VP of Sales and Marketing. I just got back from Pinehurst, where we had a presentation from Clayton Christensen, who is obviously a really interesting character um, in his own right, and a very famous author who, interestingly enough, um, was a businessman and decided to get his PhD and go back to Harvard Business School when he was 40 years old, much to his wife's chagrin. And uh, he's a, a really thought-provoking, interesting guy, um, entrepreneur, writes a lot about entrepreneurials and, and things and, and what breaks and what doesn't break. And this is not exactly what he said, so I'm paraphrasing, but I do want to give him credit for the general idea. And he actually raised a question, and he said, why is it so hard to run a hospital? And, and, uh, and again, this is my interpretation of that. These are not his exact statements or words or examples. But I, I, I do think it's apropos to the audience, the, uh, the audience here today. And it is tough to run a hospital. I was a hospital administrator. I was perhaps the worst one ever created. So I know how hard it is to, to run a hospital, um, basically because you have really three different business models you're trying to, trying to uh, simultaneously do a good job at, right? You have a solution shop where you, you diagnose a problem, a healthcare problem, and you recommend a solution. You get paid for it uh, fee for service. So you think about it, it's like consulting, right? You're doing consulting. And, and, and part of the problem in healthcare is we do a good job of paying for therapy. We do a lousy job of paying for diagnosis. And there are many examples of that. I, ha I happen to know someone who is a chronic asthma sufferer who's had chronic asthma for 40 years. And it's probably, we as, we as uh, taxpayers have probably contributed, you know, two or three million dollars to pharmaceutical drugs that don't work with this gentleman. Finally, he ended up going to um, a series of specialists in Denver that actually understand asthma. And he went into a room, and there were four or five different specialists, and they argued for 15 or 20 minutes about his case. And at the end of it, they said, you've been on the wrong ph pharmaceuticals for 40 years. The drugs you're taking aren't going to work. Here's the drug. And they fixed him over, basically, they don't fix him, it's a chronic disease, but basically the drug medication they gave him immediately worked, and he felt 1,000% better. So this idea of coming together and getting paid by the right diagnosis versus therapy, I think is an important idea that we should talk about. And Dr. Kaiser and, and uh, uh, Bill will probably have something to say about that. They may agree with me. I may not agree with me, but we'll see. The second business model that happens in hospitals is a start to finish business, right? Where you ship a product when it's complete. In this case, a person, right? Someone comes in with a disease. You ship them out uh, when, when you think they're healthy. Now, the problem with that is, and I was talking to Bill about this earlier, is you know, with <clears throat> 20 to 30 percent readmission rates after discharge, that's a major problem. So uh, the product apparently isn't complete when people leave. And that's a major problem because his hospital doesn't get paid for readmission once they're discharged. So it's going to cost him millions and millions and millions of dollars. And we've got to try to see if we can fix that problem going forward. Now, what are, what are businesses that do that? Those are food service businesses. Those are educational businesses. Uh, that's another business model that takes place in a hospital. The third business model that takes place in a hospital is something called a facilitated network, where, where people help each other, they share with each other, and the model, the payment model is a fee-for-membership payment model, like a telco or eBay, or in fact, the, the MedSphere ecosystem. Now, I'm a shameless self-promoter. I'm not supposed to say that, but I said it anyway. So Lauren will yell at me about that. But the idea where you actually share information, right, for the betterment of the community is a very powerful idea in healthcare. And, and companies that enable that uh, are very, very powerful. So my hat's off, Ken, Bill, others in the room that are running hospitals. It's not easy because you have three different business models you're trying to accommodate. So one of the arguments that I will make today and, and lay the gauntlet down is electronic health records can help solve some of those very difficult problems to solve. And I happen to personally believe, and the reason I'm doing what I'm doing, and I'm sure the number of the, the folks within MedSphere are doing this, is because we have the opportunity for significant disruption in healthcare that has to take place, right? We're 20 years behind every other industry. You look at the adoption of open source with Red Hat into Linux, you look where healthcare is today, and we have this significant opportunity to disrupt healthcare for the betterment of everybody. Now, how is that going to how is that going to happen? Number one, we have to have very simple technology, a very simple EHRs. Uh, and when you actually look at the adoption rate uh, of, of EHRs and the VA, the VA as an example, where the doctors train for an hour and they start entering orders, we can all argue. I would argue vehemently that the system's pretty easy to use. 
We believe you've got to innovate uh, with your business model, so create payment structures that hospitals can afford. Let's face it, most hospitals are flat broke. They can't afford, most hospitals can't afford to write a check for 20 or 50 or 100 million dollars. Can't do it. So creating a business model that allows every hospital in the United States to afford an electronic health record is a powerful idea. And then you can embed that new technology into a workflow or structure or process methodology that allows it to stick. So I believe, this is, these are my statements, not Christensen's statements, that we're at the very beginning of a radical healthcare information technology disruption movement. And I think 10 years from now, we'll all look back after we have our 10th annual one of these meetings and we have 7,000 people not in this room, um, that this idea, the germination of the, this idea is a very powerful idea and I think it will come to fruition because it has to. So I think open source is going to lead that movement. When you actually look outside of healthcare as other models, when you look at the distribution of Red Hat and what's happened in, with Red Hat and Linux where 70, 60 to 70 percent of all technology outside of healthcare is open source, um, you can see the handwriting on the wall. It saves billions of dollars a year. Healthcare itself is collaborative, right? Us, uh, we as patients get well through collaboration of practitioners. Healthcare technology is not. It's a business model issue. It's not a technical issue, right? We're here to, open source was here to solve that particular problem. The idea that, that there's a healthcare ecosystem that is developing where Ken as an MD can share best practices of how he treats folks with other practitioners for the betterment of the patient and to improve quality and reduce cost is a very powerful idea and it should happen. But the technology platform has to accommodate that. And so we're big believers in that and we think that patient care through an open source model is gonna improve at a very accelerated rate. Uh, Ken's, uh, Ken's been in the business for quite some time. Other practitioners have been in the business quite some time. Taking that wisdom that they have and translating it to young folks coming out of medical school and vice versa, by the way, is a very powerful idea. Um, open source is going to allow development of innovative in a, a, a structures in a fraction of the time of proprietary systems. Hospitals have the source code. They can innovate. They can add functionality. They can add new templates and, and at their own pace themselves. They don't have to call someplace in Madison, Wisconsin um, to actually have that done for them. The hospital has much more control. Uh, giving people control in healthcare is a very important and powerful idea. Because hospitals have the source code, they have control and they feel better about it. As care programs improve or change, so can the system. It's not a static system. The idea of having a code release every year or every two years to us doesn't make sense, right? Healthcare is a dynamic organism and is changing continually uh, and we think the system itself should uh, mirror that behavior. Just a quick word about uh, Vista and Open Vista. Uh, Vista has come, Open Vista has come from the VA. It's the most uh, proven electronic health record in the world. We as taxpayers have spent eight and a half billion dollars creating it. It's used today in 1,300 facilities. There's 200 provider, 200,000 providers using it with about set, almost eight million patient records in the system. Uh, it's used outside the United States in many foreign countries uh, besides uh, what, what, what uh, we're doing with it in the United States. Indian Health Service, uh, who takes care of about 45% of Native Americans in the United States, has a derivative in use with the system right now called RPMS. Within the VA, it's called CPRS. MedSphere has created a front end on top of that called ViewCentric, and we've deployed that to 311 clinics and 57 hospitals. There are also many, many states that are now looking at open source because they're flat broke. County hospitals are looking at open source because they're flat broke. And uh, we think that's a, that's a future trend that, um, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but it's a future trend that has legs. The other exciting thing is, and we can debate this, and Ken might have his own opinion about this uh, later, is um, the VA is going open source. Now, what does that mean? That means that the playing field is suddenly going to get commoditized for software. So uh, when that happens, uh, the most widely, most successful electronic health record in the world will be available to anybody in the United States for free. Now, that doesn't mean free you have to support, maintain, upgrade, and that sort of thing. But it'll be available at a fraction of the cost, and all that innovative work that happens from you in the, in the private sector, plus what happens to the government, plus what, what happens with other folks that are involved in it, will be available to all community hospitals in the United States. It's going to significantly change the playing field. There's a lot of people that have made, um, and I, uh, I'm very close to a number of folks that have made, uh, I think, uh, in, um, who have made not the best capital decisions for electronic health records, who are now looking at uh, sunsetting those products at some point when the VA um, starts uh, offering this product because it's going to 
significantly alter the landscape. When you look at $12 billion over 10 years, you combine the R&D budgets of every other proprietary system out there, multiply them by three, it doesn't equate. So it's going to change radically. Um, so we think that the, this, the VISTA system itself has the opportunity, we'll see if it happens, but in visioneering and thinking about it, has the opportunity to become the industry standard going forward.